How's it going, sir? Good. How are you doing? I'm good, man. Got a sick kid at home, but other than that, we're just cranking on, as you do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm. Uh, thanks for having me, dude. This is cool. Thank you uh, for for coming on. It's been an invite, a long time coming. Um, I'm not sure why I wait. Sometimes I wait for like to ask people. I don't know if it's like a. I don't know. You know what it's like sometimes. And then you ask them and like say, yeah, of course I'll come on. And I'm like, fuck, I should have done that a year ago. <laughs> well, I think that that happens. Um, you know, we're all kind of, we're all like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, I feel like you get busy. You're not sure. You, it, I, I actually prefer to meet somebody face to face at yeah. a show or at a TAC <laughs> event, you know, total, total archery challenge or just, we get introduced because of mutual friends. I used to be at the shot shows and, you know, the ATA and I'd like to meet people naturally. And then, you know, Hey, do you want to do an episode? Yeah. But I just don't get out as much as I used to. And when I first started, you know, we really didn't have zoom like we do today. Yeah. Uh, and so you, you know, it was kind of like if I couldn't do it face to face, I didn't want to do it. Yeah. Um, it's funny you mention this because I, I've actually never, other than like some sportsman shows in Canada, I've never really done any of the hunting expos. And this year I got down to Salt Lake for a day and then we had our, our first real expo at our sheep show for the Wild Sheep Society of BC up here in Penticton last weekend. And this is the first year they've really had an expo. So I set up a booth at that and I gave a couple talks. And my big takeaway from that is that I think social media give us, gives us the illusion of building relationships and it makes us lazy because after spending those two weekends back to back, probably meeting hundreds of people, shaking hands, I'm like, this is a necessity for the human experience. Like, I think we get a proxy of it through social media, which almost makes us a bit lazy. But then when you go out and you get that in-person energization, meeting people, and I'm an introvert, so that's not my natural state. I was like, I need to go out of my way to do more of this stuff because this is what it's about. Yeah, I agree. I think the first, the first, especially when I was starting out and launching a podcast and, you know, trying to create content, which I had no intention of it being a career by any right. stretch. I just loved hunting. I loved making film. And it just, I was meeting people in the hunting industry as I, I made a movie for the full draw film tour. And through that, I got a lot of feedback. I met people at some of the events I would attend where they watched my movie in the theater. And I just started recording podcasts, but it didn't, I didn't really explode in, in, uh, in viewership listen, listeners until I went to the ATA show, the Western Hunt Expo, you know, the sheep show, all of a sudden I was meeting people left and right, getting yeah. to know folks and having really interesting interviews. I was uh, sitting down with people at the Total Arc Tree Challenge, meeting them for the first time. And it definitely is under, under, uh, undervalued how critical it is, I think, for face-to-face -face interaction because so much of uh, what we do today is digital. Yeah. That that it's been overlooked, I'd say that the face-to-face -face is way more important than all this digital stuff. And you really feel it when you go to Ryan Lamper's uh, the Stealthy Hunter Western Hunting Summit. Yeah. You know, and, and it's capped at like, I don't know, 50 people. Right. Because you can only house so many people, feed so many people, have seminars for so many people as you're teaching them how to hunt and so on. But you fast forward like over a, like a five-year window three or four of those events, 150 people come through uh, the events each summer and you stack that on five years, you, you start to have a thousand people, army of people who you truly know, right. you know, and, and, and on a different level that, that really get to know you. So when they hear something online about you, they're like, yeah, that doesn't match, especially right. if it's negative, yeah. what I know. And it's, it's powerful. And then they also, folks become extremely grateful when you change their life for the better. Right. So when Ryan does that event, or I'm trying to do film, films right now in uh, doing a film tour. 
so I've got a few films I've made and I'm going, going to probably seven or eight different uh, cities. We'll try to pack the theater with three to 400 people or something and um, show these films. The reason I want to do that because it's a lot easier just to put it out digitally and make a make 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 income through partners and sponsors and so forth that way and make a living do what I love. But it's the face to face interaction I think that we're missing. And you right. do you do the whole pandemic thing, oh, yeah. and kill the movie theater experience. I, I haven't been in the movie theater except for once in three years, and I miss it. I actually loved going out with my wife or friends. But there's nothing in there I really care to see. Yeah. But I, I'm like, well, what if, what if I and others create films, take up some of those spaces? You come with a friend or your, your uh, significant other, get your popcorn, sit down, take in a movie that you resonate with, that has some meaning. You get to hang out, meet people that you relate to. I think that we're craving that actually as a as a community, as a, as a nation, just that more face-to-face -face interaction. So I'm, I don't like it. I honestly, I am not, um, into the, the face-to-face -face like I was when I was younger. I'm making myself do it though, because yeah. I think that it is important. And then every time I come home from an event like the Western Hunt Expo this last week or so ago, I never regret it. Nope. I'm glad I did it. Yeah. It's like going to the gym, man. I got to give myself a little kick in the ass sometimes to get there. But every single time when she's done, I'm like, yeah, that was, that was what I needed and, and where I should have been. I would like to back up kind of to the, to the beginning because I need to give you some credit. You played a pivotal role in both my bow hunting career and my filming career. <clears throat> because So living in British Columbia, there's not a large incentive to bow hunt. We can hunt just about every animal you can think of with a rifle in the rut. So unless you like making things harder for yourself, <laughs> there's no real reason. And I, I try to explain to people from BC, like why bow hunting is so popular in the States. Cause I'm lucky enough to go down there a lot. And it's like, they got no choice, man. Like other than maybe Utah, if you want to help hunt elk in the rut, you're picking up a bow or you're going home. Like it's just not happening. Same thing could be said for mule deer other than some like really premium draw tags. You know, if you want some of those better Alpine experiences, like pre rut early season, or you want those rut experiences, you're, you're picking up a bow. But I had, you know, long story short, did a little hunting with my family's father when I was younger, moose stuff, had a falling out with that side of the family, didn't hunt for, you know, 15 years or, or more. Early 30s, got back into it hardcore. I was a forestry engineer for 15 years, so I've spent the majority of my adult life walking around the mountains of BC solo, no trail, no nothing. So that yeah. part of it was um, second nature to me. And then when I found hunting, and specifically backcountry hunting, it was like, oh, this is my calling. And that was right around the time... You were just starting. I remember you sitting in Cox's uh, or yeah. South's workshop doing those first episodes. And I got to say, I know when it's South for whatever reasons, those early episodes, you and Snyder, that's like mm -hmm. a golden age of podcasting in the hunt industry. Like when we're talking about shit 20 years from now, that period is going to go down in history because nobody was talking about the things you guys were talking about and not the way you were talking about it. It was like listening to you guys, you know, talk about hunting elk in the rut with the, and I still do it now. I, I, I hunt elk in rifle season with my bow here in BC <laughs> yeah. because I, I can't fathom wanting to hunt elk in the rut. Now, if we're talking late season in high country, I'm all about it. Let's go. Like they're hard enough to find then, but if we're talking September, it's bow or nothing for me. And then, I was doing some kind of cool solo backcountry stuff. And I remember coming home from this hunt and I'm a fairly articulate guy. I was a consultant for a living and I failed utterly to be able to convey the meaningfulness and the impact of these backcountry trips with just words. And I was like, you know, I have a background in videography and some design and other stuff. And I was like, I got to film this stuff. Now Hush was kind of around and BRO was kind of around and those guys had their their impact, but the kind of films that you were putting together, the stuff Remy was, was putting together, 
like the stuff that had a bit more of a focus on cinematography and a bit less of a focus on just like the bro kind of like version of hunting, which I get is totally fine, but more of that epic narrative. Like this is an adventure and we're going to go on it and we're going to capture that story. And it's not going to be like a vlog, which I think those other guys nailed. It's going to be a film. And so watching your stuff and other guys' stuff like that was... And I'm in the same boat you are. As of Jan 1st, 2024, exited my consulting firm. I'm 100% full-time. I Most of my revenue comes from gear reviews and a subscription platform I've built, but I've transitioned 100%. And if you had asked me, you know, I mean, those early episodes had to be seven, eight, nine years ago. If you had asked me back then, are you ever going to be at a point where your job is to go out into the woods, review gear, and make hunt films? I would have told you you were crazy, but I just want to give you some credit because you, Thank you, especially those early episodes and the way you communicated and the fact that like at the beginning, you weren't some crazy Lampers or Remy Warren, like you were a regular dude, man, and you struggled and you weren't always successful, but like the honest way that you communicated that made it relatable. And I think that might've been just as important. And that's something I've always strived to do because I'm not one of those guys. I, I'm trying and I continue to build my skill set, mm -hmm. but, but that's why I focus more on the adventure and the, the communication of, of what it's like being out there. But I think it's important. I'll, you deserve some credit for all that stuff, man. It was really important. I appreciate that. I, I'll tell you, Jay, I will always be, I will always be to an extent in the hunting space in the shadow of Orion Lampers. Right. Uh, I can't catch up. Yeah. I'm not also, you know, gifted in the way that he is um yeah. he's something else man yeah i i'm capable very capable yeah. and where i'm at today is nothing like when i first started but you know if you've hunted with someone who who is like daniel boone reincarnated um you know so there's only one michael jordan yeah right and uh, i think there's a few men out there who just seem to have a gift and ryan does and um, but that's one of the reasons I want to hunt with him. Yeah. You know, I get criticized. I, everyone has their haters. And mine are like, mine like to cite that uh, I couldn't hunt by myself if I wanted to. I've always had to hunt with somebody better than me. I've always believed you become like the person you hang out with the most. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Ryan has skill sets that I, uh, that I admire, that sure. I want as well. Yes. And so, of course, I want to hunt with somebody like that. Um, and then also, I want to go solo. Because once, I, once I've gleaned what I've gleaned, I want to see if I can do it by myself. And then, and then I have. And so, I, I think that um, I am well aware, though, that I have my talents and yeah. my skill sets. And they are separate and different from Ryan's. And others I've hunted with, others I've had the fortune to to rub shoulders with, um, and I've always felt when I did the podcast, when I did the films, just be authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think you know what you're talking about, then then yeah, present yourself like you know. If you're pretty, you know, but if you don't know, make sure you're making it very clear. Like I know what I know. I think I'm right here, but don't. Don't ever try to be somebody that you're not. And, um, yeah, I feel like in the end, um, I'm not really motivated by the praise of others or by money. I'm mo more motivated than anything in just making a difference and doing the right thing. I know it sounds kind of Boy Scoutish and all that, but it's true. I, I really do want to just do things that are meaningful with my time, my energy. You know, I want to one of the things that I know that I'm, I am capable of introducing the world to someone like Ryan Lampers in a way that I don't know that very many people could. Right. Very introverted, quiet, not comfortable with a lot of being in the spotlight. But I also knew like, he's, people need to know someone like him. We need to learn from a guy like him. So being able to take my talents and apply them to Ryan, you're able to create a magic uh, 
together that we neither one of us could do on our own. Yeah. And I think there's a beauty in that, right? There's a meaning in that. And uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been a, it's been a, you know, I would say that some of those friendships, Brad Hunt as well, these are men that uh, I admire that I, that I, they're my brothers and I plan to stay close with them my whole life. Yeah, I think that's really important. You know, it's funny you mentioned haters. I definitely get a couple here in BC because there's people who dump big stuff every year, but they don't experience, like if, if one of your goals is to grow some kind of following or monetize in some way or, or create some kind of, of community and they can't understand like, well, how come I dump bigger stuff, but I don't get the same results. And it's like, it's only half the battle, man. Like doing the thing is important, but if you're hoping to communicate to large groups of people, it's a completely different skill set. And sometimes, you know, you're, you, you know, I really like uh, Gary V's double down on your strengths, F your weaknesses, because I do, I like that, you know, there are certain things where I think I am extremely competitive. Like you'd be hard pressed to compete with me in a couple key areas. And then in yeah. lots of area, other areas of life, I'm like average or below average. It's just yeah. the way it is. Yeah. And I have found throughout life, I'm 45 now, you know, I've done fairly well for myself. It has served me better to focus on those areas. And especially, I almost like to call it skill arbitrage because it's like, there are things people hate doing that not only do I like doing, but I'm great at. Yeah. And it's like, if you can find those little niches, like solo hunting, it, it was, it came, I could not get enough. I can be out there for 15 days. And as soon as I'm home and had a hot shower, I want to go back. And yeah. people are always like texting and DMing, like, how do you make yourself? And I'm like, right. make, what are you talking about, man? Mm-hmm. Like, I can't think of, I almost feel bad that I enjoy being away from my family that much. Like I love it. And so being able to take those things where we excel or what we enjoy doing where other people's don't, and then capitalizing on that in order to create some kind of success in your life, I think is a key factor. It's an insight that, that can help you greatly. You know, it's interesting because, you know, you're coming up right now. I, I love your work. I've, I've watched a lot of your film. I left some comments here and there as I yeah. find things I like. And I love watching um, and learning, especially about gear. I want other people's opinions. And um, I got criticized, you know, th- throughout my career because somebody that – has a vast level of experience more than me looks at what I just shared publicly and said, well, you don't have enough experience yet to be talking about X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And my, my attitude has been, I'm only sharing at the level I am aware of basically with people who are at my level or below, right? Like if you're that guy that's got 20 years ahead of me, this isn't for you. 100%. 100%. And what I'm bringing you along on is the struggle, right? Like, you're right. I wish I had what you have, but I got to earn that first. That's going to yeah. take another five years, 10 years, and whatnot. Um, so I just never, I just it blocked a lot of that out. I was like, I'm bringing to you the experience that I do have and sharing it with you. I'm not saying I'm the expert or I know it all. That's one thing for sure. But I'm just going to tell you, this is what I carry in my backpack and why. And as I learn, I'll share more. And when I decide, well, that was a mistake, I'll share that too. But the truth is, all anyone can do is share to the level of understanding that they have. When you look at Joe Rogan and people attack him for something, he's like, look, I'm just having a conversation. Yeah. I'm just telling you what, what I think based on what I know. But yeah, I don't have 30 years of neurosurgery under my belt. So right. you know, I'm kind of listening to the, the guest and I'm just trying to figure it out. And a lot of those, uh, a lot of that, the complaints and stuff surrounding that are just, they're just kind of like, they're not worth listening to for the most part. Um, but I, I, I have found over the years because when I was first, when I first, well, I went through ups and downs, you know, everybody loves you. You're a big deal. You know, you get all this attention all these partners or sponsors are falling over themselves to try to work with you. And you're trying to be as 
I'm trying to be as authentic and real as possible, never be a sellout, still make a living, but love what I do, all that. And during the course of that, the bigger you get and the faster you get, the, it seems that there's an exponential level of, of uh, you get a target on your back. Sure. And I think that's, that's just human nature. There's going to be people who, because they see you succeed, go out of their way to try to tear you down. And um, when I watched Lampers, he grew slow, yeah. deliberately mm-hmm. slow. And I think um, that's, that's, I think that's actually the better way to do it. Right. Don't, don't just appear on the scene overnight and then take the world by storm. Ryan is a naturally conservative and cautious person and right. very slow, very slow to do anything. Even when he's setting it up to kill a buck, if, if his setup, if he has to rush that setup, he may just let that buck walk away and re- right. find it again later rather than rush it. You know, that takes some insane level of caution and, and self-awareness and, and deliberate slowness. So, you know, I learned over the years after watching that he, he grew slowly and so he grew, and rightly so, to, a, to, to harbor a large audience of people who respect and want to learn from him. So the audience size is big, but it, he did it over a very slow and incremental process. And um, I, I do think that that's really, really a good way to go. I blew up pretty quick. You know, Snyder and I were the, like one of the only podcasts out on the market at Except the time. Except for maybe Cody at the time, and it was kind of like playing to a bit of a different audience, like 100%, yep. man. I think Cody and I started within a couple of weeks of each other. Yep. And then uh, Meat Eater was there a month or so later. Jay Scott had been there for a little bit. Uh, on the West side, I think that was kind of it. And the backcountry focus, like those early gear podcasts, like there was nothing like that. Like, I no. love Jay, but you got to have like a degree in statistics to follow some yeah. of his podcast. And like the way, you, and I, we need that, but that's like over here. Like all those guys were hitting on different notes. But if you had mm-hmm. a love of the backcountry um, and a love of, of gear and this adventure, like, yeah. Like to 100%. me, it's like always been centered around adventure. I want to go out and have an adventure. It's less about the animal, the size of it. A lot of it is it, that kind of dictates what the adventure could be. You know, when you're when you're trying to find a unicorn, you know, 20 miles into some rugged wilderness, getting dodging grizzly bears, it's like, okay, now we're having an adventure here. And when there's obstacles like rivers and mountains to climb and to get across and to navigate, um, and then you know you're you're getting the animal. Now you got to get it out of the backcountry along with your camp and everything else. Like all that stuff becomes, I don't know, like all men I think crave some of that, a lot of that adventure even if Deeply. it's buried deep inside. And so for me, that's what a lot of that was. And to talk about it as I learned, and I could just ask, like, yeah. I don't know how to do this. Tell me. Because I was voraciously, you know, consuming this content myself. And all I was doing was just sharing my journey as I went along. And there weren't that many at the time. Other, There weren't that no. many shows. And there weren't that many podcasts for a long time. In fact, the reason I started out with a YouTube video from day one was because 99% of the hunting community didn't know what a hunting podcast was. Right. That's very and to try to get them insight. to download an audio podcast. They were like, yeah. what are you talking about? Never heard of it. Not interested. You're telling me I got to, I'm going to listen to you talk, yeah. you know? So I could, I knew that if I used, if I used the medium of YouTube to get people to look at a gear dump or some expert knowledge from some backpackers on whatnot through a video that eventually if I hooked you on the knowledge and the, in the information you were getting through that medium that you understood and you were fine with that, then I could bring you over to the audio version on a drive to work or while you're roofing a house or while you're doing construction. I literally, Jay, I made a video on how podcasts work and how to find the podcast app on your iPhone and then how to subscribe and how to then listen to them you know, download them to your phone. If you went hunting, you download 20 episodes and listen to it throughout the week. Like people had no idea. Half of my job was just to teach them about podcasts and how they work. And, uh, I think that guys like rich Cody, rich, even meter and others benefited greatly 
from what I did to get the hunting community converted into the podcast medium. And then within three or four years, there was hundreds of podcasts and this market was very saturated. People saw what we did and thought, well, I'll do the same thing and I can, uh, you know, my dream come true. Yep. And, um, and so I think for a long time there, there was just every Tom, Dick and Harry had a show, every hunt, every uh, business started to have one. And, uh, and the market got very saturated. And that was one of the reasons why I turned more to film and put emphasis on film. I got bored of podcasting after interviewing, you know, and having 400 episodes. I was like, how many times can I talk about calling elk Yeah. or what's in my pack? You know, I was like, I want to inspire people to get in shape, to, to have an adventure, to go outdoors. I want to teach you how to do it. I want it all in one package so that when you sit down and you watch a film and we've gone someplace remote, New Zealand or, or into some wilderness area, we're up there, we're killing giant, whatever. We're getting it into a raft and we're floating 20 miles back out. Like I wanted people to see that and, and go, Oh, now that I've seen how to do it, I think I could, or maybe, maybe I can't do that, but I want to someday. So I'm going to start over here. I felt like that film medium also always was the, my chief passion. You know, the podcasting was something I fell into, but I had started, remember, with a with a full draw film school with Cody Kellum and the bro right. guys over there on the weekend in the Oregon coast. And I made a movie for the full draw film tour. I had no intention of doing a podcast. I just, you know, and then when I did do it, I didn't expect it to be popular. Right. I, I thought I'd have some friends. I'd meet some cool people, which I was. I was getting to meet some neat people. I had no idea that within a couple of years, my whole career and tra- life trajectory would change. That's interesting. There's a bunch of points in there I want to hit on, but I think that last note you made, I would be very interested in <clears throat> what those couple years were like and what type of lessons you could share with people now. Cause I got that one of the most common questions I get is like, how do I get sponsored? And I just, I get the heebie jeebies every time. Cause it's like, if you're asking that question, bro, you're looking at this whole thing backwards, man. Um, but I would be interested in because the other thing I get is like, people are like, how do I transition to make this my, my full-time gig, which I think is a better, smarter question. But what type of signals were you getting? Because you come from a pretty professional background. You don't have a small family. You had financial obligations and your family's used to a certain standard of living. You weren't 25 and just all you did was ever hunt. You know what I mean? Yep. yep. What type of signals were you given that you're like, okay, now I'm ready to take the leap. And what kind of ups and downs were there during the, that, those first couple of years that you could pull out some lessons from that have served you, you know, later on in your career? Because I do think you've gone through this arc. Like, I think there's the early Brian call and I think there's the mature Brian call. And when I look at your films now, your content now, the way you convey yourself, you're like a man who has come into himself. Like there's this comfort and this ease about you that wasn't there as much. Like you were getting after it. You were super hungry. The stuff was good, but there was also this like, and I'm not trying to be negative, but like a little bit of anxiety. And I don't know if I should be doing this. And I mean, I even qualified to do, I, and I relate because I'm, I'm going through the same thing, but you have kind of transitioned into that second stage now where it is less about validation from others and you're like, this is what I do and this is what I'm going to do and, and that's okay. And yeah. I'd love to hear how that transition occurred. I, you know, when you, it's impossible not to look back and I am a religious guy. I kind of look back and I feel like so much of it, uh, the timing and how things happened almost as if, you know, there's, there's a providential right. influence in like the hand of providence was there throughout. And, and I'll just, the, the way it kind of happened was, you know, I made a lot of money with the old job. I was an IT governance and compliance analyst. I ran the IT change. I was an IT change uh, coordinator, uh, basically the manager at a big fortune 500 firm. Before that, I did consulting for with uh, Arthur Anderson. Uh, I was I was there with a big five accounting firm. I, I, things were I was on a different trajectory. Yeah, and I had done the Dave Ramsey Total Money Makeover. I had followed uh, uh, Tim Ferriss for Four Hour Work Week. I had read all this stuff on um, 
independence. And really what I was pursuing at the time was wealth and freedom, Yep. you know, and you can't have the freedom without the wealth. So, so yeah. I was like, okay, let's get yourself wealthy enough to do whatever you want, you know, to have freedom. And so I did total money makeover. I got myself completely out of debt, all my college lo student loans, all, I mean, I was driving around, I was your typical six figure plus income guy, wife, three kids, um, the diesel, brand new Dodge Cummins, the toy hauler, the toys, the house, the, all the stuff and in debt up to my eyeballs. You know, I didn't really own any of it, but I could finance a great life, but I wasn't building wealth. You know, no one really taught me and I had a lot of credit card, I had just stuff. Mm -hmm. And when I, when it, when I listened to, when I read the total money makeover, I was like, no, this is, I, I'm a slave to all this. Sold the truck, sold the toy hauler, sold everything, got rid of it all, bought a $800 Dodge Neon, rusted out, drove that to work every day for a few years, took every penny I had. I was upside down. I, I, had, to, right. I had to come up with 10 grand so I could just unload the truck because I owed more on it than it's worth. Toy hauler was worse. I was sitting there earning money on weekends with other jobs, construction, roofing houses, to to get all that extra money to get out of debt in that in like a two year window, I think we did it. Wife and I did it in like just under two years, no debt. Then we saved up three to six months, basically six months of of income for to cover all of our expenses, so we could basically live for six months right. with cash in the bank, no more credit cards, no more debt, no more financing. Once that happened. I could pay cash for cars, vehicles, things I wanted. And I was willing to buy something that was nice, but I paid cash. You know, my first truck after that was, was a 19, like 93 Ford F-150 that had 20 miles, 20,000 miles on it. Right. It was old as dirt, but it was still like new because an old guy had bought it. I was pretty proud of it, but I paid cash because if, if I'm not going to finance it, I'm going to change my whole attitude on what I buy. Right. You know? So I got it. And then, Jay, I didn't do jack. I went to the CrossFit gym. I worked out. I hunted as often as I could. And I played. I worked from home. Dave, uh, I learned how to, through the fruit four hour work week with Tim Ferriss, how to work from home three days a week and go to the office too. I right. was literally putting in two 10 hour days and then taking the whole week off. Mm -hmm. After three years of that, it got boring. Like I got paid well over six figures and I showed up at work twice a week and coasted. I had tons of free time after a while. First it was great because I had all this free time and wealth, no debt. And when you're making that kind of money and you don't have debt, that's a lot of money. Yeah. When everything's paid for in cash, it starts to be a lot of money. And so I did the podcast out of um, it's sort of the trajectory, like everything I was engaged in was pretty selfish and shallow, going to the gym, just doing whatever to bored of it. And I wanted to, uh, learn how to, uh, um, film my hunts better for my buddies and I, right. and I, and I wanted to write some articles and I wanted to do some things that were more meaningful. So I started to learn how to run a camera for photos and video. And I just went down that for a year or so and uh, spent all my time nerding out on films and all of that. Still no intention. I didn't, I was just personal. Right. But then uh, my wife got cancer. Oh, and yeah. I remember this. She was uh, going through cancer and that completely changed my entire, you know, they say like uh, comfort is the enemy of success. Right. You know, and I had a lot of comforts. Life was good. You know, life was easy. Why would you change it? Why would you upset the apple cart? Mm -hmm. Like there was nothing pushing me to change my life. I thought I had it figured out. And then when my wife was sick with cancer and going through chemotherapy, all those days going to work, I began to resent. The way I'd spent my life, I began to be angry about. I, I was angry about her having cancer in general. And it completely changed how I saw my life 
and what I wanted to do with it. And I didn't give a damn if I had money or didn't. What I wanted was to have had more time with her, more adventures, more things to have experienced, more relationships, more m m more hunts that I that I could have seen and been on, more people I could have made lives better for. Like everything changed. It, none of it mattered. That seemed to matter so much before she had cancer. It seemed to matter so little, and then new things mattered more. And at that point, um, I just had a I don't give a damn about corporate life anymore moment where none of it mattered and why was i building all this wealth anyway if i didn't get to experience it with her because i was waiting till i was wealthy in 70 to i don't know do 50 to do what why not just today and so at that point i said um i was getting pretty good at the filming stuff and you know and um i had started i went to the film school and met those guys at uh with the full draw crew and I had made some movies. This was all on the side before cancer. Yep. And then, and then, uh, so I kind of had this thing I had started. I did some podcasting, you know, at that time as well for fun. This was never intending to be a career at all. And I got approached right off because within the first three months, the podcast was pretty popular yep. for the little, I, no one, it was just kind of giving this, vision of what I saw as cool stuff to, to people. It hadn't been done really before. And it was getting popular and companies were coming to me. I remember, you know, Vortex came and they were like, Hey, we love this and high five of me. And it was really cool. And they were like, Hey, we'll give you this big check. And I, I remember going, no, no. Cause this isn't, I already have, I'm wealthy. I yeah. don't need your money, but I love that you like the show. Just give me some product and I'll, I'll but I don't want to be owned. Right. I don't, I don't need to be owned. This is a guy who spent a lot of effort to get himself out of debt. I took off the chains. Nobody owns me. Nobody tells me what to do. I can say whatever I want. And let's be honest, like the early podcast, especially still today, but then was pretty irreverent. Uh, yeah. I bleeped out most of, the swear words, but I mean, we could trash on any piece of equipment we hated yeah. and then be positive about any piece of equipment we liked. And if you sign up with somebody, that independence goes away. Yeah. If you become partnered with people, now I can't just be me. I can't just rail on the industry or whatever I feel like. I think that's doing. part of why it was part of the golden age. It was, we just don't like, it's just not, you know, I've done the whole unbiased, non-sponsored thing, and I have I have zero relationships, and I've been able to build something where that's not required to do what I do. But, but part of the part of the you know impetus for that was that it shifted, man, between then and now, and yeah. now ninety five percent of the content you see out there is bought and paid for, and I think that was one of the beautiful things about those early days because it had happened before that, like. Nowadays, no, people start a podcast to get a sponsorship. You guys it, started a podcast because you had a love for something that you wanted to communicate. The partnerships and stuff were almost an afterthought. They were. And that is um, one of the things that I, I we, by the time I got into this, hunting TV was disgusting for me. Oh, yeah. yeah it yeah, it yeah, just yeah. was like, this is all biased. It's all couch. It's all sale. It had become corrupt to the point where I was zero. I, it didn't connect with me at all and the yeah. cliche i shot the deer now i'm sitting behind it and i couldn't have done it without all these sponsors all the stuff stacked in front of the trophy it was just like it was very uh fake and yeah. um contrived and so it didn't connect so i thought what i was doing was just being real so i said no to all of it uh even even um you know as i was doing work with i mean i said no to everybody and and it was fun. And we just kept having fun and kept having fun. And uh, I went to um, the Western Hunt Expo. No, the, the ATA show. Okay. And uh, I had met Casey and Jordan with Snyder at some events from Mountain Ops. And um, we got to know each other. And they're like, hey, come down, to the, um, come down to the ATA show with us. We got a little spot there. And we love your podcast. You just need more guests way more guests come down here. We'll put a guest in front of you every hour and just interview people. 
get to know them, figure out what they're about, do your thing. I'm like, my boss at work, I didn't have the time. I just did it. I just ignored the, uh, I just said, I'm working from home. And then I went to <laughs> Indianapolis. And uh, I had deadlines and deliverables. I would go and do the interviews. I started the interviews. I did 10 a day, 10 hours straight, one hour, That's one every hour. Crazy. That night I got back to the hotel room and then I did my work job for five or six hours, went, went to bed for two hours or something, got back up, repeated it. When I left that weekend, I had something like 25 interviews with some of the most influential people in the hunting industry, people I, li- I wanted to get to know, people that interested me. I sat down with Cameron Haynes. I sat down with Yves Shockey. I sat down with, um, with uh, you know, I mean, the list is pretty long. Um, a lot of it was hunting TV shows at the time because right. we didn't have YouTube at yep. this level. And they were the big players. They hadn't converted it over kind of more into the digital space yet. So, man, it was a pretty wild time. And I came home from that and I was publishing a show a day trying to get as much of that out. So I went from 50 episodes to 70 episodes, 75 in like a few weeks. Right. In the meantime, I went to more shows. And at this time, it was starting to become... A the other thing is nobody's consuming. doing this. You got to put yourself in the place and time. Nobody's doing this back then. Now it's almost gotten a little bit cliche, yeah. but no, you wouldn't. Need, the other interest. This was the other real big insight I had from going to the shows. You think you're marketing to people outside your circle on social media, but you're not. The way right. the algorithms, it's just an echo chamber in there, man. Everybody who knows you already knows you, and that's it. When you go to these shows, though. It's like, oh, the real world networking algorithms of how people meet people and do stuff. And there's no big leftist woke tech company sitting over you all, you know, commanding how you meet each other. The natural reach and the growth that you have from that, I think, is one of the most undervalued growth opportunities right now. I don't care what business or sector you're in. I wasn't on. I was on Facebook barely. Right. I hardly had anybody and I barely posted. Instagram was ne- barely a thing. I had no all. Instagram at all. Yeah. I hadn't even opened one at this point. Never, never had an account. So it wasn't like I could just go on there and get Cameron Haynes ideas. Right. They were on YouTube, if at all. And he posted there somewhat. And they was on Facebook somewhat. If I wanted to get into the mind of anybody, it was through the t- curated TV program. So right. here I am offering an insight into people asking the questions that I want answered and letting people experience them. It's not as novel now because you can get on anybody's, you can yeah. get onto South Cox's page and consume as much of him as you want. And you probably a, send him a message and he'll get back to you. Like most of these guys are right. pretty reachable. Yep. But back then getting yeah. a one-on-one with South Cox and tapping into his mind and what he's doing, it was novel. It was new. It hadn't really been done. Those two episodes, and, there was two, right? Back to back. Like yep. it was one episode split in half. I remember watching that and I was just, I've probably watched it a couple times. Like yeah. it was, yeah, man. Just changed my whole, uh, uh, like uh, the learning curve for yeah. becoming a better hunter was skyrocketing for me as I got to have these conversations. So when I went to the Hunt Expo a few weeks later after the ATA, Cam came up and he had Joe Rogan with him. And he's like, hey. I remember this one. Uh, I love your show, dude. Cam's talking to me and uh, Snyder. And he's like, I love your show, man. I, it's a great, great show. You guys do great. Make me laugh. I love the, uh, the bow hunting stuff. It's good. And I said, well, Joe, I got a few headsets right here. Do you want to sit down and shoot your shot, my friend? a quick show? <laughs> and he's like, um, I said, 15 minutes. That's it. Just 15 minutes. He's like. Yeah, 15 minutes. We'll do 15 minutes. And then, um, yeah, I I could grab 15. And I was like sweating. I I hadn't been really nervous about anybody I had interviewed up to that point. But I knew podcasting. I had done construction for forever. Unlike a lot of hunters um, back then, it seemed that didn't know a lot about podcasts. I had consumed podcasts for eight years or so up to that point. And I consumed a lot of Rogan shows. I knew what I was dealing with, this powerhouse, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, Cam as well. And uh, their friendship was just budding and kind of growing together. So when they sat down, I mean, I was real, um, really happy. I felt so grateful. I didn't know what was going to happen as a result. But the show was pretty magical. It was funny. 
at that 15 minute mark, I was like, okay, Joe, well, I, cause I wanted to really respect that relationship. And he's like, we can stay. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. it turned out that he wanted the out if he needed it. Yeah. But when it was good, he's like, screw it. And he stayed for 45 minutes. I think it was. And we just clicked. All four of us were having a good time. I was laughing. Cam was great. Uh, some classic lines in there. And I really enjoyed it. And Joe was so gracious and Cam. And then they shared it on their own platforms. Joe went back to his own podcast a couple of days later and said, I was on the Gritty Bowman podcast at the at this show. And, you know, we had this great conversation. And so he he not only was a guest on mine, and then they all reshared some clips from it that I put out, but then they also um, mentioned it on the show a number of times. Right. Jay, my whole life changed from that day forward. Like, there was no... At that point, it went from being just a... Um, you know, we were getting like fifteen to 20,000 downloads an episode to 100,000 downloads an episode <sighs> of just new influx of people. Right. And now I, I had already created 75 shows and I added another 25 through the Hunt Expo that way, 100 shows. So I had a library. That's the brilliance just, of the back catalog. People don't appreciate that. Like yeah. you think you're grinding and paying and no one's paying attention. But then when you hit that moment and you have that back catalog, because if you don't have that back catalog, when you hit that moment, you will lose them because there's no route to like sink them down into your ecosystem. But Bingo. it's funny I, how all that little stuff, like if you hadn't had that back catalog, wouldn't have mattered what happened with Rogan because you wouldn't have had that ecosystem to bring those people into thousand percent thousand percent because people were saying to me i can get you this interview i can get you that interview i can get you this interview this one this one with this famous person that fan. and i'm like i don't want to tap into that opportunity until i have something i've created that i know is valuable that i need yes. to draw eyes to right now there's not enough there to and so it was it was almost like made to meant to be where right when when joe did come on and somebody, anybody who, who was into hunting and into podcasts could go and look at 75 shows plus one a day for the next 25 days on top of it with, you know, riding the momentum and go, there's at least two or three guests or topics that interest me out of this. And I knew, I felt confident if I could get one or two people into there and Jay, I heavily edited in the beginning, I would interview people for an hour or two. But then I would go through and I would pluck out the best parts, right. the best. I feel like I do this with my film too. I didn't want to, I don't want, I, I'm a busy guy. I don't want to waste your time. Now, Joe Rogan can sit down and often it's gold the whole two hours, three hours. Others, you know, they have their high parts and their slow parts or it's, repeti it's repetitive. So for me, it was like, if you sit down, and listen to a gritty podcast. I want everything to be gold, like the whole time. So there's no parts where you're like, eh, I'm losing me or I'm lost interest. I'd stay on topic. I'd get, you know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes, but I would, I would do interviews for two hours. And I told the people, every guest I had, I was like, we'll, we'll just have a great conversation. And then I'm going to edit it down to probably half this size. Right. Because I just want, I just want whenever you sit down, it to be dialed. I had so, nothing else to do. From a tactics perspective, there's this there's this saying in writing: "Kill your darlings or kill your babies." Kill your babies. And, yeah. How? Because it's hard, man. I sit down in front of the editing, you know, in front of Premiere, and I and I start chopping away, and I try and leave the ego at you know at yeah. the door when I come into this come into this chair, but are there any tips or tactics or things you've found that have worked for you that let you be a little bit more ruthless so you can get to that gold and cut out a lot of the fluff, even though there's like a bit of a eh, kind of moment when you do it, especially with question. the films podcasts, I could kind of get films are tough, man, because e even the moments that don't seem consequential still have an emotional impact for you because of how intense those hunts are. That's a great question. You know, I went to the BYU's Marriott School of Business. Yeah. And in that school, we basically it was primarily 
we, we learned accounting, we learned finance, we learned uh, computer information systems, we learned all that. But I'd say the bulk of my courses were all around business communication, both writing yep. and verbal. And man, they just hammered us and hammered us and hammered us. And they'd give us a page of an email that someone wrote and they'd say, get this thing down to one paragraph. Love it. And say the exact same thing, one paragraph. It was brutal. And yeah. for years, uh, that, was, that was what you did. Concise, efficient communication. That's it. That's all it was. If you can say the same thing in four sentences that a guy does in three paragraphs, you're winning. Yeah. And so when I started to do film, I started to approach it the same way. When I did the podcast, it was the same way as I learned at the school of business. And I pretty much would jot down what was said in the film in, in, in lines. Yep. And that's my scaffold for the audio bed is my story that, and so whatever I capture audio wise, that's what tells the story. I would just put it all down. If the same, if the concept was repeated more than once, I picked my favorite one and cut out the other two times. Mm. If I said, I'm going to climb this hill and get around to the top. And if we can find that buck, we're going to, and I said later, we climbed the hill. Yeah. 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 You see this all we found now I'm buck. here where I told you I was going to be and halfway totally. through, I told you again, I was on my way. And it's like, I'm like, no, you get to yeah. say it once. The audience yeah. isn't stupid. You get to say yeah. it once. And if they can get the idea without me explicitly Show, explaining don't it, tell. cut that even, out too. Even better. Right? And so I just cut, 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 cut. And I, I, I felt like the more I cut, the better it gets. Yeah. And you're dying inside because that yep. was a beautiful shot. And yep. the way this, the emotion and this and that and this. But guess what? The only one who knows that that was taken out is you. Mm-hmm. The audience only gets the end product. Right. And if it was slapping the whole time when they watched it, maybe you cut too much. Maybe you did, but they won't know it. And you won't, it's better to err on too much cut than not enough. And so when I approach my films, mm -hmm. and I'm not always the best at it, but most of my films are, look, I want you to get maximum information out of it in the smallest amount of time, maximum value out of it out of the shortest amount of time. I'm not here chasing minutes. I'm not here to chase a 22 minute film or an hour long film. I want you to sit down, watch a film and, and it's efficient. So for example, if I film, if I, I might turn the camera on to the lampers and say, okay, quick interview, tell us where we're at and wh what we're doing next. You know, we're seven miles in, we're after mule deer, we're going we're gonna to get some breakfast, and then we're going to hike through this uh, cliff, we're going to get to the top to our glassing point, we're going to look for some deer. Great. Then I film him making breakfast, getting out of bed, I film me getting ready, I film us hiking up the hill, climbing, 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 we get to the top. We get to the top and I say, okay, Ryan, tell me what we just did. He's like, okay, well, we're seven miles in. We got up this morning at this time, we hiked this trail, we climbed to the top, and we just spotted a big buck, and here he is. Okay, I have two interviews to choose from, either the one in the morning or the one in the evening. I get to choose. I might even have one I did. I might choose mine over Ryan's. Like, I might have one I did in the morning and one he did in the morning and one I did in the, in the evening or when we got to the top and one he did it when we got to the top. And I might start the film, go, you know what, I like the one where uh, it's more dramatic when we're just sitting there glassing. Or no, it's more dramatic in the tent in the morning when it's quiet and there's a little bit of rain, whatever. And I'll grab the first interview. Let's say we start with the one at the top. We're at the top, and Ryan will be like, we're up here seven miles into the wilderness, da, 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 as he does. And uh, we camped on this knob. And now you're seeing the shots of the knob, of how far we've hiked. We climbed this mountain. This whole thing, description, took 45 seconds for him to say. And you saw about oh, 20 shots that explained that. And now we just saw a big buck. And boom, there's a buck on the screen. You have in 45 seconds to 60 seconds, a complete picture of what the hell is going on. And now yeah. you're in the action. There's a buck and we want to get him. How are we going to do it? In one minute. Now, if you look at the vlog channels and the other YouTube channels, yeah, they don't do that for you. They don't ram as much information into the shortest period of time in a way that you, that you get the point. Instead, they say, we just woke up. There's a talking head. We're going to get breakfast. We're going to da, da, da They tell you the whole thing. Yeah. Then they film themselves getting up. 
And then they film themselves eating breakfast and then they film themselves climbing the hill and then they yeah. film themselves talking about how hard the climb is. And then they film themselves at the, and you're, you're seven, eight minutes, 10 minutes into the show and nothing has happened yet. Yeah. Versus 45 seconds. You got all that same information and now you're on the hunt. And I just think that's how the podcast was too early on. I would go, man, this guest was, they had, some amazing nuggets of just brilliant information. They were funny. So I always take funny. That's priority one. Number okay. one. Right. It's rare. It's rare. If it's funny, you're keeping it in a film or in a podcast, no matter what, because funny is rare. It's not as easy. It's, it's not as common. It, it's not, not everybody can pull it off. Funny is just, and every it's universal. Everybody likes it. Sucks so people in too. It's like, it's sneaky. That's why comedians are so powerful. Like they talk yep. about really heavy shit, but they do it in a way where they're like sucker punching you with these like philosophical points, but they're keeping you laughing. So, and I think hunting is hunting and hunting yep. related topics can be the same way because if you grab me, now you have my attention and yep. you can feed me the educational part. But if you try and do that before you grab me, I'm probably going to tune out. So I kind of identify funny, 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 funny. I'm keeping it no matter what. And then, uh, then I'll go through and go, okay, what was the topic? What are we trying to teach? Education, education, education. These are critical educational pieces. And the delivery of it like this is, is, is money. And uh, then it's anything inspiring. Did they say anything that makes me want to be a better man, better husband, better father, better hunter, better anything? So I, I'm looking for entertainment. I'm looking for education, which is empowering. And I'm looking for inspiration. It, it made me want to change who I am. Um, people can get educated. doesn't mean they'll take action, right? If there's something in there that says take action. And a lot of podcasts are educational and somewhat inspirational mm -hmm. and terribly not entertaining. Yeah. If you can't make it entertaining, <clears throat> it can be really difficult for a person to sit through the whole show. Yeah. That's why I think one of the reasons like, you know, Ryan and I, or Aaron and I were, uh, we laughed a lot. Yeah. And that humor, um, really connected. It was a weird, it was almost a slapstick partnership too. Like the way you and oh, Lampers, was a straight it was like man. A, a more and, easy relationship, but like you and yeah. Snyder, like it like the tension and you being the straight guy. And like, there was definitely some chemistry there. Uh, albeit after a while, Dude, maybe the mix I wasn't to, so great, but like there was a golden spot there in the middle, you know? Yeah. We, we both had to dance because yeah, I definitely come from a much more conservative and, and yeah. different kind of background. And, and Aaron, you just throw a Molotov cocktail right into the middle of something. And I'm like, I'm editing that out. That won't be in the final production. Uh, and, um, and, and people could see, feel that like, yeah. Oh, Aaron, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, like this is the other perspective. And then he would lose his mind because he's like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Are you kidding me? And we could have this back and forth. That was fun. I truly, yeah. truly cherished those times and, and, uh, loved the, uh, that interaction. It was, but you know, it was kind of like, um, you you were constantly dancing around yeah. um, a, a landmine, yeah. you know. My whole life was trying to, you know, not step on it, not yeah. not cross the wrong line. It was it was a lot of, uh, it was a lot. It was a lot, and it was not it was not easy to do. And life was, it was a challenge. And I don't know that that kind of sparking chemistry is sustainable for indefinitely. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I kind of felt like it was magic and I didn't know how long it, it could last. And, um, and I rode as long as I could try to make it work. But when, uh, when Joe got off the show and our, our numbers skyrocketed and Suzanne had just finished chemotherapy and my whole uh, idea of what life was really about had flipped upside down. At that point, I decided, you know, I came to her, first of all, right away, Every company in the, all, yeah. not every, but, but all these companies were calling me and saying, hey, what would be the terms of a relationship? How could we work this out? And my approach at that time was um, I freedom, freedom number one, freedom number one. After that, you know, 
um, you know, let's let's work out a relationship where I can go hunt with guys that wear a different camel pattern. Right. Is that is that and if it, that was a deal breaker, we're not having a partnership. If you know, I'd be like, okay, I don't mind just shooting a Hoyt. I always have, for the most part. I'll, I'll shoot that, and I can work on that, and that would be a good partnership. I don't want a partnership, let's say, you know, with clothing. You know, I don't, I don't want to be head to toe in one thing. There's a lot of options out there. I don't want uh, a partnership in broadheads. Like, there's too many broadheads I want to try and use, you know. And so I tried to pick some partnerships that were limited, quite limited. And so I, I really picked up like four. Okay. There wasn't a lot of, there, I had Yeti as a partner. I'm like, who cares? Yeah. I like Yeti. And I don't really care. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sitting here trying to battle, have the cooler battle. You yeah. know what I mean? Great. I'll have a partner with with uh, Yeti. You know, um, I I like this. But I'll do that. I I can shoot Hoyt and not talk about other bows. That's fine. I'm not really the bow guy. I'm not really. I'll just tell you what I know about bow hunting and shooting bows that I enjoy. But yeah. I, I'm not here to try to sell you. Uh, you know, I'm not here. I feel like compromising what I do. I'm about backpacking and the outdoors and this kind of thing. So I was very careful about who I would start a sponsorship with so that I still had ample freedom to do what I wanted to do. And, but they were knocking down the door, dude. And when they gave me the, the options and they all were willing to play because hunting TV deals, no, they were like, no, yeah. we're not doing that. If, if you showed up on a meat eater episode, you're head to toe. It doesn't matter who you are. Mm -hmm. you're, 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 nobody's rolling in on Sitka on a meat eater episode. No, they're exclusive. No yeah. one's rolling in on a Randy Newberg episode, not wearing Sitka. No. And so that sort of stuff was kind of unheard of at the time. And I'm like, it's digital. You play it our way or you're not involved. Don't do it. And I was able to set my own terms for some limited partnerships. And I told my wife, Hey, if, I'm looking at the numbers here. I keep doing what I'm doing. I make, I don't make as much money, but I make, I make two thirds. Yep. And it's enough. We don't actually need as much as I've been making. Yep. She's like, do it. Yeah. Chase your dream. Life's too short. I almost died. Who gives a damn about like all of this security that's almost smoke and mirrors anyway? Yep. Go do, go do it. And so, I went in, told my boss, I'm going to be a podcaster. And he was like, what? And, uh, and then I, I went out and I remember the first day getting up and telling myself, Brian, never forget how this freedom feels. Right. I'm my own boss. No one tells me when to get out of bed. No one tells me when I got to be at an office. No one tells me any, I do. I'm my own man, my own boss. And, um, from there I was able to start, you know, building and then, over time to fast forward to today, the big challenge in doing what you love for a living and also making it into an income, mm -hmm. um, that's tricky. And I look at you with a subscriber audience, which is a brilliant way to do it. I don't think that when I first started that that was – people weren't willing to pay. That wasn't a thing yet. <clears throat> It wasn't there yet. I, I dreamed about it and I, I thought, could I make it happen? Cause I, I was still aware of it. And I did start my own subscription uh, community on the locals with lampers and stuff. Uh, there was Patreon and some other things out there as well. And uh, I wanted that cause I, first and foremost, um, I don't, Jay, if anyone who knows me knows I do not like being told what to do. Right. I just don't. I would rather burn it all down and lose everything I own than be bossed around. I just don't do not do well. Now, I'm good at taking instruction, especially from people I respect, but I you don't tell me what to do. Um, and I struggled like that. That's where partnerships ended. Don't tell me what to do. Don't, don't boss me around. Don't dictate the terms of how we're going to work together. Let me do my thing. I'll add value to your brand. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like those terms, we're not going to get along. I'm not for you. Go find someone else and I'll find someone else. But over time, 
none of that worked for me. I went straight commissions. If I sell a product, if I use a flex tail, like a little air blower for my air pad and I use it to stoke fires and I love that little gadget and you buy it and I get a commission from it, great. If, if I sell a, a, a TP I like and you, and you buy it and I get a small commission from it, great. I'm using this stuff. I'm telling you what I'm using. And I'm going to pass a discount code on to you. But I'll use supplements from more than one supplement company. Right. I'll use teepees from more than one teepee company. I'll, 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 if I like this guy's product over here and this guy, I'm selling them both. And you can like it or don't. And my pitch to companies, they're like, look, I can sell a half a million dollars in product for you of stuff I actually like and use within your brand house. But I'm not selling those things because I'll never use them. Right. I'm not telling anybody to go buy that because they're not for me and I don't believe in that product. I know you sell it, find someone else. That's not for me. Let me be authentic and tell people what I actually use and like and pass on a code. And yeah, I'm selling your competitor stuff over here, but you're still getting a whole chunk of this that I believe in. Do you, do you want to just leave it all behind because you want me exclusive? Or will you take what I'm offering and we both win. Everybody's win. My consumers, people who follow me are happy. I am happy. And you're, you, you should be happy. And that's basically how I structured everything as I move forward. And um, the freedom I have now, it's just, I, I just can authentically go about and do what I love to do and use the stuff I like to use. And then just say, if you like it too, check it out and um most m mostly i i, I kind of don't really care anymore uh like you were talking about i feel like i grew up in front of the public right from how i was a decade ago to where i am now i i went through a lot of lows highs and lows the highest of highs and the lowest of lows as i sort of built you know, a brand and, and played around in this space. And, um, you know, when I go to trade shows, there's a series of relationships that I get to shake hands, hug people and say, it's good to see you. It's been a while. And there's a series about half of people where we're not friends anymore and we don't talk or look at each other. Right. And generally that's, that's something where when you're, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, I'm not a, in the hunting space, I have some notoriety, some, some recognition, right? And anytime you're, you, you have some of that, you're, I mean, I, re I remember reading Matthew McConaughey, uh, Green Lights, mm -hmm. and he talked about how he would do these movies and he was the hottest thing in Hollywood and everyone was like, dude, I love you. You're awesome. You're this movie was legit. And he's like, when he did a movie, he was like everybody's best friend, all the parties, all the money, all the deals, everything. And then he'd drop a stinker and, you know, he kind of didn't get the publicity that looked good. And, you know, and then they're like, yeah, Matthew McConaughey, he's not really getting any roles anymore. And he's kind of a has been. And then he'd run into people and be like, Hey, how are you? And they're like looking the other way or dodging him. He doesn't get invites to parties or like, he's not the cool kid anymore. And he's like, it, 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 it would happen over and over in these cycles. He said, when I saw that, I realized that um, the way to play that game is just, just know who each of those people are. Right. There's the guy who calls you up and says, oh, dude, I knew you were, you, 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 we were going to crush it. I knew you were going to revamp your career and be this guy and do this and do that. Right. Now that you're, kind of hitting again he's wants to be your friend right and and that's kind of the cycle that happens whenever you're public facing i think and uh you just go through it and it's disappointing because you know when i get to know somebody you're my friend it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what but when you're when you're in sort of this corporate corporatized uh sort of uh industry um it's full of shallow um, vapid, you know, um, people who are just looking to exploit and make money 
um, gatekeep and all that kind of stuff. And that's one of the reasons why uh, Ryan and I get along so well because we both um, we like to be an island. We we like to just be our own thing over here mm-hmm. and just not be in the mix, not be uh, caught up in dramas, gonna not get caught up in the latest controversy. You know, really, really, I, um, and, and that's, I used to throw myself into the fray, dude. I mean, I used every, the, every conservation initiative, I was in the front of it. And, and, um, I, I sort of over time felt the need to just circle the wagons and be around the people that a circle of trust of people that I felt like were the right kind of people that really, um, had my back and I had theirs now fast forward. And it's like, um, I'm hitting a new phase where I feel like, well, it's time to, to, to create more of a face to face community, put yourself out there more. Ryan has helped with that, with his summits, you know, and I've seen the value in that. And I go to the shows and I get to meet people and I'm like, yeah, I need to be, I need to put myself out there a little bit more and, and engage in a, in a, face-to-face sort of community in a way that I haven't for a long time. I think that's an interesting segue um, because I've already had you on for more than an hour and I want to respect your time, but I'd like you to share a little bit about the Western Bear Tour because I do think, you know, I had Lampers on a few weeks or maybe a month or so ago. And one of the things I ask him that I try and ask everybody because my... I'm great at solo hunting and I realize I've used it as a crutch because I do find it challenging to build relationships or find people to build those relationships. I find it easier to not have to compromise and just do whatever I want, whenever I want. But I've realized there's a limit to that. Like I do think it's like training in the gym. I think you're better off training by yourself than you are with a subpar training partner. But when you find that perfect partner that gels with you perfectly, I think you can be better off as a duo than you'll ever be alone. So I'm, I'm really trying to exert some energy this year. I've got some hunts booked with some guys I've never hunted with before. And it's taken me out of my comfort zone. But one of the things I asked him is, you know, how do you recommend, like, what are some tips? What are some, you know, actionable, you know, recommendations we can give people to find hunting partners? Cause it's really hard. And that kind of led to the conversation is that the summit in the bear tour. And a lot of what we're talking about here, about building face-to-face relationships. I do think that is an excellent opportunity. If you're somebody who is newer or you just got to a new community and you don't know a whole lot of people, some of these, and, and there's lots by really great people. And I don't almost don't really care where people go as long as they're, they're going to one of them. But I think I'm a huge advocate for, for bear hunting. You know, we both have a very good friend in, in Lander, um, and have Mm -hmm. bear hunted up there. And I, that's where I started my bear hunting. And I, you know, I love bear hunting. And I think it's one of those areas where people don't care so much about competition. You ever hear somebody pissed off that they were at your bear spot? Not really. It's not the same. And I think there's more of this welcoming environment. And I think it's an even better entrance into the hunting community because people aren't as clicky and they aren't as protective and there isn't the scarcity mindset that there tends to be with some of the other trophy animals. But I think it'd be a great segue to like tell people what the Western bear tour is about when it's happening. You know, I think last, the first one's coming out this weekend. I think it was like five tickets left (laughs) last post I saw that are probably gone by now, but I know there's a couple other weekends that are coming up here in the near future as well. Yeah. So we, we, uh, it's interesting because this is all an experiment, right? To Mark Livesey with Treeline Academy, yep. uh, Ryan Lampers, we're, we, uh, we decided, hey, let's get together and like the Western Hunting Summit, let's do a bear summit where we talk to people about how to hunt bears. But let's make it a, you know, a, a multi day event. And, but instead of them having to fly to Bozeman and, you know, really commit to this, you know, kind of capped event. Let's see if we can scale this up, take it to, you know, Boise, uh, Missoula. This first one is in Missoula this weekend. Um, we're headed up tomorrow actually, but it's a uh, Friday, Saturday. I think there's a few, there are more spots available. I believe if okay. people are interested. They can go to, is it Western bear tour.com Western bear tour.com. And, uh, and they can find the details there. And then the following weekend, uh, which is the 
8th um, of March. That one is uh, in Boise. So you can still get tickets. There's, they're getting close to full. We had an event scheduled for Salt Lake City, but there's really not that many bear hunters in Utah. Oh, interesting. Because it's an arid state. Yeah. It's dry. You know, what we should have done is take that tour to the Northwest. Yeah. You know, where you, wherever you can get over the counter bear tags and there's tons of bears, that's where your bear hunters are. Yeah. If you have to draw, you guys like got to come, week, you guys got to come up here next year. Like bear hunting is, and I don't, I don't know what to come across. It's got to be pretty simple just to come and teach for the weekend, but doing something in like a, even like maybe a Kelowna because it'd be a little more mm-hmm. central or doing something in Vancouver. Like bear hunting has gotten huge yeah. in BC and we have, we get two tags per person every year. They're all over the place. We have a very leftist government right now. And the one thing I'm not worried about is losing black bear hunting because even the hikers, they kind of piss them yeah, off right. and all the farmers, they piss them off. Like yeah. it's, I feel very safe about that hunting, but yeah, Pacific Northwest, I think especially like a Washington or a Vancouver, like people well, the, like the hunting demand, bears, like- man. We, we, we kind of did our research. We knew Montana. We yeah. knew Idaho. We'd crush it. We overestimated uh, the Utah sure. crowd. And uh, and then the feedback that we got from angry Portland, not Portland, but Oregon and Washington folks that are like, right. dude, are you kidding? You're not coming to our neck of the woods? Yeah. So, but we, we, we did have no idea what we're doing in terms of like putting on an event like this. Sure. Uh, we are just like, let's try it. There's a, couple hundred people at each event that's a place where you're going to meet mm-hmm. fellow hunters and have the same sort of adventure thirst that you do most of the the men and women that have gone to the western hunting summits that ryan does each year jay that they have met long lifelong hunting companions there they, 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 where they could never find them at home. Now they're like, they're in man. it with someone who gets it that wants to have that kind of experience that they do. Even that so, commitment filter, like it says something about you that you're willing to book a weekend off work, hop in a car, hop on a plane, and like go to a place. Like just having that alone in your personality gets you up into that sphere of people yeah. I'm looking to spend my free time with. And it, look, I mean, someone who's willing to suffer, go through that, learn, challenge, sacrifice. You know, it's not that easy to find that person, but when you can attend some events like these, they're all over. And you click with somebody and maybe you attend a multitude of them and then finally it's like you and somebody are on an archery shoot, you know, together. And that's where the Total Archery Challenge or the Western Hunting Summit, we do our shoots, you know. You you get to hang out day after day with somebody. Right. You you figure with out what they're all about. And I think that when you do find somebody, they become lifelong friends. Um yeah. and it's pretty cool to be part of this this community where we have we get pictures now, Ryan especially from guys who went to a summit. Right. All four of them went out and hunted together and they come back with like these success stories and they're all they're all buddies now. And now sometimes they just, they, they come back to the summit every year because they wouldn't want to miss it. And it's amazing to repeat people that come back to the summits. And we're kind of open, like that the same thing happens with the bear tour right. that repeat people come back and they say, I went to the bear tour last time. This time they're going to talk about mule deer or elk or this. I'm going, I'm going because I know the quality of their events. And I know what, what I get out of it, the fulfillment I feel, how it challenges me, how I grow, the empowerment I have. And you can only do so much through digital means. Yeah. I'll tell you, Jay, I don't know where, I don't think that I would be the Brian Call today, where I am today, if I did not go to that full draw film tour, called Cody Kellum up, it was a Facebook ad, Yep. Hey, we're going to teach hunters. There's 10 spots. You want to come? It's at Cannon Beach, Oregon Coast. Here's a phone number I called. I want to go. Cool. I watch all your stuff. Love all your DVDs because they weren't on YouTube. That's nope. for sure. I showed up. 
I met Christy Titus. I met Jason Phelps. I met South Cox. I met all these people in the hunting industry, all the born and raised crew. I met them all. Uh, I learned and other people and I learned how to run the camera a little more, but really what it did for me was it created friendships yeah. that are still intact to this day. And they validated my life, my interests, my passions and said, you have a, a gift here. You've you, you got a natural, we're all seeing this ability to film and produce content. We have a lot of experience and yet, you know, this weekend we feel like your stuff's on our level without ever having any, just, just no training. Yep. And so all of those things, you never know what happens when you go to these events. I wouldn't, I've had that sort of push and validation because I didn't think I was anywhere. I, I thought I sucked. Yeah. I thought I, I thought it was a joke. I thought it was kind of just, it was a hobby. Right. But then I remember Rich Froning talking about the CrossFit games and he was doing CrossFit in his garage or whatever. And, um, his mom or somebody enrolled him into the games and he's like, all right. And so he went and he thought he was just going to get crushed. And after the first day he was like in first place and he was like, this is not happening. I don't, this doesn't make sense. And, or, or at least in that top tier. Yeah. And after four or five days of whatever the event was, he walked away going, I have, I'm, I'm actually, I never would have thought that I was as good as I was. It didn't click. But then when he was around other people, it, it like came home like, no, there's something here that you could pursue. And so I often wonder, you know, had I not put myself out there and gone to that film school, would I just sort of played around with it at home and, you know, never had that validation never really pushed myself you know yep and i and i think that yeah that's true i remember at the time by the way the reason i went i was listening to a podcast i listened to a lot of i loved crossfit and i was listening to the barbell shrugged podcast and their first i think 200 shows were great i loved them um they had a little magic thing going on there and uh, but they were talking about how important it would be to go to seminars go to classes, go meet people, go get some formal instruction from somebody that those things that people, those physical events that they went to, they attributed to their success right. in everything that they, they did in the future. And so now I'm like, man, I can see that. I think that some of these types of events that you provide an opportunity for people to attend can be pivotal, life-changing like events for them so and what happens when that when that happens jay when when we do something that is life-changing for somebody they're grateful to you your till they die like i'm grateful to cody and what they did and i feel like a a debt there and then i'll feel till till the day i die i'm grateful because he changed my life that much by that one weekend joe rogan i'll be grateful to him till the day i die he, he, he made me like quit my job. I don't know if I ever would have taken my foot out of the business and gone all the way in. Right. But the validation was so intense and so sudden and so clear. I'm like, I can't stay here. I got, I got to go and pursue this dream. So, you know, I think that these moments where you meet and it's face to face and, and you have these type of moments, they can be those uh, turning points in your life that just, change your whole your whole life so yeah i think the bear tour is going to the, i have trepidation right we're going to get up there we're going to show people we're going to share it we have our projectors i have a movie night we're going to show there all this stuff and it's like uh, we think it's going to be good jay but, yeah. <laughs> but until you show up and we actually deliver um there's a little bit of nerves going into it you know yeah but i think it's i think it's um one of the things that I've decided years and years ago, and I, this is why I really, I really appreciate and I've admired your work from afar for quite a while. You know, I started getting people hex like at first I was annoyed. They're like, you, I, I don't like your gear dump. Go listen to uh, Jay's gear dump, you know, mindful hunter. And I'm like, 
who is this guy? <laughs> After I got a few, I'm like, who is, who are you talking about? You know? And then, um, and so I started to go through and follow. And, and at first I was ready to tear this guy apart, whoever he was. And then, then we get into it and I'm like, Oh, that's good. That's really good. Oh, I can't follow him for that. That was a great review. Or this is really, really, uh, really good. And I saw the hustle too. And so I, I look at that. Um, and I just, I really value that because I look at you and I see some, I see some, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, I see us having similar trajectories in, in ways, yeah. similar paths. And it's really interesting to, to watch it. And I see that you're putting your balls out there, man. It's just like, boom, here I am. Yep. You know, yep. crucify me if you want, <laughs> but here's what I think. And there's a certain amount of, um, it takes guts to do that. This, uh, I got called by a friend and said, Hey, Let's do this. Uh, go. I know you've been talking about this film that you did with Go Hunt and Brady Miller of this moose hunt. And I, I've heard you talking about how you're going to take and you're going to show it in some theaters. Well, why not, uh, you know, get some balls and show it at the Hunt Expo? I'm like, yeah. that's in like four weeks. I don't have time to sell the tickets. I don't have time to like, I didn't even got the movie done yet. <laughs> They're like, that doesn't sound like the Brian call. I know. Yeah. Like, make it happen. And I'm like, you're right. All right, throw it up on the site. I'll do my yeah. best. I'll call some friends. Let's try to sell the tickets. I'll try to, and I'm, I'm working evenings in Mexico off of Starlink trying to make a movie and get it ready to show at the expo a few days after we get home. And uh, we pulled the whole event off. Yeah. It wasn't the smoothest, but we did it. And that sort of, I think, separates the men from the boys, the people that are willing to throw caution to the wind, go for it. I remember I did a live stream. This is my, this is, this is where I sort of maybe went a little too far. You know, uh, I was always like willing to test myself and be humiliated publicly. Sure. But when you, when you win, you're a hero publicly. Yep. You, you, you get all the gold, you get all the losses. Yeah. And I've always been like, don't be a coward go all in. And I've done that. Lampers, he's way more cautious than that. Mm -hmm. He's only going in if he's going to win. Yeah. <laughs> like he knows I'm going to win. I was like a lot riskier. And I remember doing this live stream of a hunt I was on and I made a bad shot uh -huh. and it was live. Yeah. It was live. I made a bad shot and the whole world saw it. Now, if I had made the great shot, I'd been a hero. There was like 25,000 people watching on this stream back when Instagram was more less censored and more yeah, free yeah. and actually actually uh, rewarded content. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that was like, I, was, I went from hero to loser real quick, throwing mm -hmm. all caution to the wind. So I tempered a little bit over the years, but I still have that same attitude. Like within reason... You you got you you if you gotta you gotta take chances, and then do your best to win, and uh, sometimes you're gonna fall on your face for that reason, and you're gonna take a lot of slings and arrows for it. But I would much rather be the guy, that uh, the man in the arena than than the guy who is who's always playing it safe, not putting him out there. And you, my friend, you throw it out there, even reaching out and saying, "Hey, you want to come on a podcast?" That takes guts. And not that many people uh, have it. Well, thank you very much, man. And I really appreciate you taking the time, Brian. I mean, the honesty and the vulnerability. And I know myself, you know, I'm always trying to get value for the audience when I do these podcasts. And that's not only the real, that's not only, the, you know, I used to prepare a lot more than I do. And I, I started learning that preparing less actually created a better conversation because I just followed the little threads wherever they go. The only question I'm ever asking myself while I'm talking to somebody is, how can I maybe gently guide this to deliver more value for the audience? And I think this was one of those rare ones where, I mean, I hope it was valuable for the audience, but I can guarantee I took a lot of value <laughs> out of it because you did kick down the door, man. You and a couple of the other guys at the early parts for the rest of us who came through later. Like it was funny seeing Hushin's booth at Western Hunt Expo. Like, listen, maybe not my cup of tea, 
But I respect the hustle, man. And if you want to talk about the business model for how to merchandise a hunting brand, like those dudes crush it. Like I was like, <laughs> this is crazy. You're like, you got three gaps in here. There's like eight cashiers and like the, 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 the strategy and the execution. And then like, this is a well-oiled machine. And it They're is like just the like meat eater of Utah. It's you know it's what crazy. I mean? Like, like the, the, yes. the, the branding machine is, uh, they have there. I have tremendous respect for hundred percent for, uh, for how they are able to, you know, and uh, they've been authentic in their own way too. Like, again, it's not my cup of tea, but those guys are who those like Eric Chester is Eric Chester until the day he dies and you know, love him or hate him. He keeps doing what he wants to do. And I respect that. Yeah. The thing is to, um, and Eric is one of those men that, because I've known him a long time now. Yeah. And I just think people find him easy to dislike. Ironically, he's probably one of the classiest, best yeah. human beings that I've ever spent time around. And anybody who I actually just, spends time with him, that's the takeaway. I've never heard an exception to that. If Unless somebody's just going off simply, the hearsay, but people who know him say the same thing. He's simply a good man. Period. Yeah. The end. End of story. He is a good man. So you may not like, you know, they, the the way that uh, they tackle a hunt or the way they 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 do it might not be your cup of tea. I love backpack hunting. So yeah. for me, I didn't grow up in Utah either. I don't. I'm not used to the sort of day hunt type stuff. And yep. Um. But um. Yeah. I I look at all that. I I can still look at uh, various people in that industry and have tremendous respect. I mean, I. I, their booth is something to behold. Not it's just crazy. their booth, but their website and yep. the professionalism, the organization. It's really cool. It's, it's really very cool. impressive. And then I look at others like I barely have, I don't really have a website. It's just right. YouTube and it's a podcast and kind of half assed, you know? Um, and uh, I think it's important, though, that you're just authentic. Yes. Like it's not really me to kind of go that way. Yep. You no. Know? I don't have the heart or the drive. I want to make a movie that inspires, share it with you. And uh, I don't really want to take the time to merchandise or build a hat or a shirt. Or I. But kudos to those who love that, mm -hmm. who love apparel and clothing and all. I just don't. Ryan and I are like, we sell the same three hats for <laughs> eight years, you know, with our loved yeah. one. And uh, Ryan has to stick with the really old man style, unstructured hats. Um, yeah, it's just not, that's not where, where we're at. But like you said, um, I can still ha really value some of, uh, some of that. And they were there from the very, they were there long before I was. Yep. You know, Hush has been around a long time. Long time. Yeah, they're pioneers, man. What I like uh, about that is they, you can see the growth though. Yep. You know, like, when I look at the early stuff and I have to hand it to them, I've enjoyed watching a lot of their stuff in the last year or two, a couple of years, actually, I think their production quality went way up. Right. And uh, some of their hunts really interested me. Other brands that I used to watch religiously, I feel like they just came down. I don't right. watch any of their stuff anymore. And so to me, it's like, man, I'm really interested in those guys that reinvent themselves and stay alive, that reinvent, uh, that read the market and go, okay, time to adapt, time to find a way that's different than what other everyone else is doing and, and really bring value to the public and stay relevant. Because there's a lot of brands that when I started years ago are completely dried up and gone now. Yep. There's those that just stagnated and never grew anymore. They're just still, still small. Then there's those like Randy Newberg, that sucker just <sighs> reinvents, 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 yeah. reinvents. I have so much respect for Randy. Again, I'm not really interested in watching the old man go out and hunt. I love Randy to death and there's a, all sorts of content I'm going to follow and I am going to watch some of his hunts so I can make fun of him later. But... <laughs> When I watch Randy's stuff, I'm like, I'm more interested in watching what Remy did yeah, because it's much more harrowing than what Randy's doing. Of course. And, and so I think, though, what's remarkable is Randy's all, you know, the hunting TV shows, but then he goes digital, then he goes YouTube, then he goes subscribers, then he, the man can reinvent and stay relevant in such a way that I have tremendous respect for it. Yeah, 100%.
Listen, I'm going to put everything in the show notes, links and that kind of stuff. I know we got Western Bear Tour coming up, but anything else on the horizon, film-wise, hunt-wise, that people should be keeping an eye out for coming up in the near future? Yeah, thank you. I plan to, I'm working on taking the film tour on the road where I can, kind of like full draw, but yeah. just just the gritty version. Um, and I'd like to be showing it at some of the Total Archer Challenge events. I'm talking, uh, I'm kind of exploring that option. But I plan to take, uh, I plan to do a, a series. I'll put that on our website. And then um, I'm looking at dropping a gritty season around November, probably okay. 12 films. Um, banking it all until that that time frame, and then uh, I have a lot of really. It's been a long time, Jay, since I put out films, right? But that's kind of because I'm trying to to pursue a new model. Like, can okay. I show? Is there a demand for a theater? Is there a demand to like like turn the lights down low, have the surround sound and the music just right, and really take you on an epic adventure? Mm-hmm. And I only want to make films moving forward where we had a pinnacle achievement. If we didn't do something that's just epic, I don't want to make a movie out of it. Right. Which means there's fewer movies because yeah. not every hunt gets to no. be like that. No, they don't. Yeah. But if you look at when I first started, if Ryan and I went bear hunting, you saw something epic. If we went mule deer hunting, you saw something epic. We only put out like six movies or eight, but they lodged in your mind. Yeah. Now, the you know, it's like, well, I've, Dumped 22, 24 shows. Five of them were epic. The rest were just like we went hunting. Yeah. I don't want to produce that. Right. So right. I am um, really working at banking together each year, I think, truly pinnacle hunts. Hunts that are where you get that unicorn. And hunts where they're, they're filmed so well and produced so well that you say everything Gritty makes is a banger everything you don't want to miss a single one because they're all just good which means that quantity is going way down but i think that's okay because at the end of the day i i i i want to pursue the pinnacle experience and the pinnacle film i i i want to get that unicorn and i want to bring it to you and um inspire you and anything short of that i i feel like i'd rather just focus on podcasting and other things with my time. So that's where I'm at. And uh, I just need my audience and folks that are fans of gritty to be patient as we uh, get ready and look for, for, look for some badass stuff to drop in the fall. I love it, man. Thank you again for taking the time. I deeply appreciate it, brother. Ditto. Back at you, brother. All right, man. We'll chat soon. Cheers.